let's get started. My name is uh, Jordan Garcia, and I'll be giving a talk on building huge flux code bases uh, without compromise. So just a show of hands in the room, who here works with uh, Flux or has done any Flux in the past, whether it's like sample apps? Cool. Almost everyone. So a little bit about me. I'm a staff engineer at Optimizely. Optimizely is uh, the world's most popular A-B testing tool. And uh, in 2014, I had the mission of re-architecting our front end. Um, obviously, Flux was one of the choices that we went with. So in 2014, we realized we had a need for something, and that was once we started implementing a lot of components, we ran into issues of which components owned what um, in terms of maybe we pulled an entity from the REST API and several components on the page wanted to either read it or write to it. I think this is a pretty common pattern, not just in React, but in any component UI. Um, so there really became a clear need for a client-side source of truth and preferably one that was immutable. Flux architecture at the time was becoming very prevalent and I thought it fit very well into this idea for a solution to this problem. Uh, we're currently on our third iteration of uh, our in-house Flux implementation and we've open sourced it as Nuclear.js. Um, and a little optimizely, we're a team of about 30 developers that touch the front end code base. Um, we have over 500 components that use Flux. So scaling in terms of people has been a top priority for us. Uh, we want to make sure developers feel comfortable, feel like they have the tools they need, and don't need to reinvent the wheel anytime they try to solve a problem. So our goals when re-implementing our front end was one to a higher velocity. Uh, we had used kind of a bastardization of several frameworks in the past, and what that led to was basically no usability in our code. Uh, so we couldn't reuse concepts, we couldn't reuse components, or you know, if we had a page that wanted to look like another page, we would copy paste it. So we're in a pretty bad spot, and we wanted to we want to invest in architecture now that will be reusable for years to come. One developer is creating new ways to solve a similar type of problem that had been solved. Um, one of the issues with React in particular is it's a component that handles the V in MVC. Um, but it's pretty unopinionated about a lot of things, about the models, about your data layer, about even things like where the constant should go. Um, so we didn't want developers feeling like they had go-to place when they need to use any of the well-known constructs in our code base. And lastly, we really wanted to improve our client-side testing. Um, not just improve our test coverage, but have it so that a new developer could come into our code base and know, hey, here's what tests are for for these particular things. So components have specific component tests. Flux modules have their own sets of tests and should be easily run. That's, that's a really big point. Um, it doesn't matter if you have great testing uh, if you don't have the infrastructure that's solid, if you don't have something that's easy to learn, people will not write tests. And we don't really have the on, you know, enforcing people to do a certain thing. Um, we tend to like to make things easy, and if it's the easiest option, people will do it. So, when we started implementing Flux, a lot of people take this approach. You have your actions, uh, we have a concept called getters, which I'll get into later. Um, you have stores, and when you start off, you don't have that many, so you kind of group them together. Um, and this works for a very short amount of time. So after a week, you know, we have more, and two weeks, you see the picture. Um, and anyone can tell you, if you continue down this pattern, you're going to lead to problems with code base organization, but there, there are more intrinsic problems to this. And that's, as soon as you want to start doing things like bundle splitting or optimizing your payloads, it's very hard to do so when all your files just live in the same place. Um, developers tend to like to use directories as a hierarchy of what code should talk to other code. Um, you know, if you write 
require statements and your relative path is in the same directory, you feel pretty good about that. You feel like you're not really violating any, anything. But if you go out five directories and up a few more, that, that just feels wrong. And what this pattern enforces is it enforces a comfort in anything requiring anything. And it just leads to very coupled code. So it kept getting bigger. We had a problem with this, and we ended up refactoring it to be a little bit more domain specific. Um, but we realized quickly that that wasn't enough. We needed a full on architecture and a organizational solution to really solve this problem. Like I said before, there was no real separation of concern. Uh, you know, in the beginning when Flux is new, it, it feels fine to kind of require things, you know, any store requiring another store or a component requiring any actions. But as you scale out and as you start to build different products and start to really differentiate between this code is implementation code of our product and this is core library code to our product, then you really want to have these boundaries. And even if you go to a domain-driven approach but you're still all in one place, you don't really get that kind of hierarchical enforcement. And lastly, where do tests go? I'm personally not a big fan of the style of writing tests in a completely separate directory as the code they live in. Um, I think if tests can be written, you know, right in the file, then it's very obvious which files are not tested and which are. And lastly, Flux doesn't really solve any of these problems. I'd argue that Flux creates these problems. Um, when you use a more fully fledged framework like Angular or Ember, you kind of get these prescribed solutions because the framework itself has so many opinions on where things, what things are. You know, Ember has a very specific idea of what a model is. React has no notion of a model. Flux has no notion of a model. Flux is an architecture for state management and data flow. It doesn't prescribe what should be in your state, nor does it describe what the purpose of that should be. So these are problems that, that Flux creates, and I'd argue these are probably easier problems to solve than the issue of MVC where there's coupling between your models and your views in a non-unidirectional way. So for us, we really took the approach that we needed to create the right abstractions and build a platform to solve these problems. There's so many things in, in a code base and in an application that there should only be one of. You shouldn't have multiple ways to do push state routing. You shouldn't have multiple ways to show a very fundamental UI component. And without a foundation that's easy to use, Developers will be given a problem and solve it themselves. That's the nature of engineering. So if we can create a platform that abstracts these most commonly used patterns in a place that's easy to use for developers and easy to maintain, then we can achieve our goal of moving at a higher velocity. So to do this, we have to understand where Flux plays in our system. Like I said before, Flux doesn't solve a lot of problems, but it solves one very big problem, state management. Having Flux centralize all the state in your application has so many benefits, and I think most people here that use Flux have clearly seen these benefits. It's everything, just understandability. Being able to, at every point in your application, see the entire state of your application is amazing. Being able to write tests where you can, in your after block, all flux.reset is amazing. It allows us to mock our data that isn't completely stubbing everything, but is predictable. It also allows us to do great things with testing that we could have never dreamed of before Flux. Um, we have a whole set of tests that were created because of Flux, and those are UI integration tests where we actually do end-to-end -end testing on the UI, interacting with it in the same way a user would. And if it wasn't for Flux, we could never have done it 
at least in JavaScript. I mean, this is a problem that's most of the time solved with something like Selenium. But being able to do it in a native JavaScript framework using the same tooling that you use for unit testing means that the same developers can write these tests that encompass so much more. Lastly, Flux acts as both the dispatcher of state change, but also the thing in your system that answers questions. Components should be dumb. Components work well when they're dumb. They shouldn't know how to change the state of your application, and they shouldn't be too concerned with how to receive state from the application. And I actually think this is the part, the latter part, which isn't solved very well within the Flux community. A lot of implementations kind of treat this as an afterthought. And that's the idea of abstracting a question in a way that a component can answer it without coupling itself to the underlying stores that need to answer the question. And it's also, from the other direction, you don't want a single purpose stores for a specific component. Um, most of the time, if you have some common piece of information, say a, a list of users, well, component A may want a certain transformation or certain shape for those users. Component B may need those users to be joined with another entity. It shouldn't be the concern of either the component to know how to join those, nor should it be the concern of a store, which is a core piece of your Flux architecture, to special case things for this component. So solving this problem was something that we really took seriously in our implementation of Flux. <coughs> So understanding the purpose of Flux is essential to building a larger platform in which you can abstract and analyze the problems that you have in your code base. So before I get too deep into what it means to build a platform, I think we need to first go over some vernacular associated with our in-house Flux implementation, Nuclear.js. So we built Nuclear Q3 of 2014, and we built it at a time where, to be honest, there weren't a lot of good Flux implementations out there. Um, the most prevalent one at the time was probably Facebook's Dispatcher and their idea of stores as implementing the event in, emitter interface. And a few red flags that stood out to me immediately were, one, if we're trying to build something that's solving the problem of state management, why are we creating several little pieces called stores that all have their own state? To me, that seemed like an anti-pattern against the problem we were solving. The second part was store.waits for. I never quite understood this. It seemed to me that no store should know about any other store. And the problem of stores knowing about other stores is really a lack of actually solving the real problem which is, how do I create answers to questions that my components will want to ask? So Nuclear really focuses on solving that problem. So a little background. Nuclear is very much like Redux. For how to keep state. We put everything in a single immutable map. Uh, I believe the uh, term coin for this is atomic flux. Um, this came from using immutable JS is a very natural fit to want to just put everything in a big map. Um, we had done things before where we had distributed things into uh, stores, but then our stores would be in a map where they'd have an ID. So even when you put it up with an app state map, whether it's in a store that mixes state and functions, or if it's in a place that is purely data, you end up with the same thing. So we chose the purely data approach. So the one big thing that Nuclear does differently than I'd say most implementations of Flux is we have this concept called a getter. So getters can come in two forms. In their simplest form, they're an array, and an array of strings. So a getter can act as a key path into your app state. So right here we have the selected product ID. And obviously that points to this part of your app state. So if we were to evaluate this getter on its own, 
it would return us the value 2. Products returns us this products map. And I don't reflect it here, but when this data is in our flux system, it's immutable. So it's in an immutable map. The second form of a getter is shown right here. And that is an array, but the last argument is a function. So if people are familiar with uh, one style of Angular dependency injection, this should be very familiar. Where up until the last argument, you have other getters or key paths that are passed to a function that returns a single value. And what's great about this pattern is it allows us to create transformations of our data in a stateless fashion and in a way that relies on pure functions. One of our big philosophies at Optimizely is if the more things that can be pure functions, the better your life will be. If you can create the hard parts of your system as framework constructs, and what I mean by that is I mean things that need to know about a lot of different pieces of the system, things that need to know about a lot of different state, or things that need to handle complex state transformation. If you can build those as part of a framework that accepts in it as configuration pure functions, then you're left with something that's very easy to test because once you test the framework, then when a developer creates a new getter that's a pure function, testing a pure function is trivial. So what this getter does is it has two dependencies. It depends on the selected product ID and the product's map. And it returns the selected product. Getters can be evaluated, meaning at any time, we can synchronously get the value of a getter. Getters can be thought of as sort of a functional lens. And when you put that lens over an application state or any immutable map, you get a value out. Another thing I didn't mention is getters can depend not only on key paths, but also other getters. So this uh, concept is really powerful because we can now take the selected product getter, and if we needed to say, join this with users who have bought this product, let's say we have that information in another part of our application state, then we can now use this getter as a dependency to another getter that then joins it with another piece of the app state. Meaning if a component only wants the selected product getter, then they can consume that. If they want the selected product with the users joined to that, then they, they, they can use that getter as well. It creates a loose coupling between components and stores in a way that is stateless. Lastly, the really powerful part about this abstraction is that not only can you evaluate getters, but you can know at any point when they change. And these two facts, evaluation and observation, are all that's needed to build a flux system that can seamlessly communicate with a reactive rendering framework like React. Having the ability to know when something changes in your system and to run a callback is very powerful. But it's even more powerful to know when derived state or computed state Whenever that changes, being able to run a callback with that is immensely powerful because you don't have to manage the dependency tree of what this getter represents. So a consumer of this doesn't have to know anything beneath the surface of what getter represents. It's these two constructs that have helped us build out so much of our framework. And it's the concept of getters as being an actual unit in our system that allows us to scale. Instead of having stores that have to accommodate all the needs of all the components that use them, we have getters that accommodate the needs of specific components that use them. So that means we can organize our code base in a way that makes sense, because we're not creating coupling between our stores and our components. So now that we've overviewed the type of Flux implementation that Optimizely uses, let's look at the platform that we've chosen to build. 
the base, we have what we call the core. Just a show of hands, who in here is familiar with uh, Zakas on building large-scale JavaScript applications? Anyone? So, so there's a concept of that in, called the sandbox, which the core is very much modeled after. On top of that, we have the heart of our code base, and those are modules. A module takes a specific domain of your Flux architecture and groups it together. So instead of having all of our actions, all of our getters, all of our stores, and all of our tests in their respective directories, we now group them by the domain that they pertain to. So our user module may have actions that create a user. They may have actions that log a user in. Then they may have getters that point to the currently logged in user or the currently logged in user's friends. They have stores that maintain the state of the currently logged in user. And lastly, and this is, I think, pretty important, which is seemingly a minor detail but goes a long way in terms of developer productivity, is grouping our tests in these modules. We know the module's test coverage by looking at the module's test file. We know which modules have tests by looking at that. There's never the question of, hey, I just created a module, where do I write tests? And this is, this is a big win, and it's also a very simple thing that I think most people can do in their code base, which is just make it obvious where tests go. Because if you want good testing, you have to create a culture around it, but also make it easy. Because I think there are very few developers that actually don't want to write tests. It's the case where writing tests is so cumbersome and so hard, and there are no good examples where you see code bases that have very poor test coverage. And lastly, on top of this, we have our component layer. And we intentionally decouple components and modules because we see components in our architecture more as the controller and view layer. So in terms of server-side MVC, a good architecture is MVC plus service. So you have models which represent objects within your business domain. You have controllers which take requests and give you back responses in the form of views. And if you only operate within those three things, you end up with either really fat models or really fat controllers. And really, neither of those are desirable. So much like services in MVC architecture, modules provide us a UI agnostic grouping of logic for a specific domain. And the concept of modules is, is very powerful as soon as you want to step outside the world of web applications. If you do things right and you build a module correctly, you've now built all the logic for a user. You've built all the interaction with an API, You've built the persistence layer for knowing what user's logged in, what user isn't logged in, and you've built tests for that. And if you can transport that same logic to the server, then now isomorphic rendering becomes a lot easier. And we've even taken this a bit farther, and we've used this in desktop apps and also React Native apps with little to no effort, because these modules have no notion of a UI. They only know about the tools that we give them, which are flux, a UI layer, and a router, but they don't know about how they're used in specific components. So what this means is we can take the same core logic, the same core fundamental service, and create different products or different ways of representing that, whether it's through a different workflow, whether it's through a mobile web view. We can create that using the same logic and keeping the things that we want to keep dry, dry, and not having to write, you know, throughout our components. So this is the picture I showed earlier about what our code base looked like uh, when we first started with Flux. And this is what it became. As you can see, we've grouped things 
by domain, we have stores, actions, tests, and getters all in one place. So let's talk about the core, because without a solid foundation, it's very hard to build a platform. And for us, the three main things that we really felt were globally reusable Flux, a UI layer, a router. So Flux provides a consistent way for modules to say, I have state that I need to maintain in the runtime, but I don't want to do it myself. This is really crucial because if you don't have this, building a stateful module or a stateful service defeats the point because now this is only usable under certain conditions in your runtime. And it's also very hard to test. It's not as portable. The second thing is we want common UI functionality. Good design means you have consistent user experience throughout your product. It's very easy to design a consistent user experience, but if you don't have the right tools, you'll often see that it is not so easy. So examples of, of this that we want, we want a consistent modal dialogue, or a consistent, a consistent way to launch modal dialogues. We want the same loading indicator everywhere. We don't want three different versions of that. We want the same animations throughout our website, and we want them easy to make. We don't want people to have to imperatively script transition animations or write new CSS anytime they want to introduce the type of functionality because we want to standardize this across our product. Putting this in the core and doing it in a way that can be extended to every piece of our code base has helped us do this. And lastly, we need a router. Um, if you're building a single page application, routing is a concern you can't ignore. Um, there's inherent logic in push state, and I'd argue more that the router is really some problem of how to update on this page and just correctly. And there's a lot of opinions about this. The one we chose, which was easiest for us, was an, an imperative routing mechanism. So we use uh, PageJS, which is a client side based implementation of Express. So we a series of functions and you. And this is not the prescribed core for everyone. Your core could be different. You may have special concerns for your business or for your application that mean you want to make certain pieces of functionality more centralized and more reusable than what we have here. The important thing is to think about what is really core to what we need and how can we build in a way that's agnostic to the implementation. And this is just an example of what using our core is like. So we have a module that we require. We show a dialog. The dialog is passed options, which are the component and the props. And it shows a dialog. The actual implementation of this is a component on the page that is hooked up to a store that is populated by this show dialog method. But as a user of this, all you have to know is the function signature. And you can put any component in there. And you get a consistent dialog every time. So the more of your core functionality that can be implemented in this manner, the more consistent your user experience will be. So this is an example of a module in code. So I talked before that modules have three core things. They have stores, where a module declares that, hey, I need to keep track of state at one time, and I want another system to do that. And that system is Flux. They export actions, which are the interface between modules and components. So instead of implementing a click handler that dispatches actions in your component layer, you simply call an action that a module exposes. 
They also export getters. And I think this is really what brings the module pattern full circle. The ability to group something by domain and not only group its functionality, but group the types of data access patterns that you want to expose in a way that doesn't expose the implementation. So for the dashboard module, which we have here, we may export a getter that gives you the list of products for the dashboard. Or maybe it gives you the list of products for the dashboard that are sorted based on the, the sort headers you have selected. Or maybe you have a search box on the page, and the search box populates a store that filters the products. Well, as a component that's showing lists of products, I don't have to concern myself with any of that information. All I have to know is that there's a getter in this dashboard module that tells me what the current products that I should show are. And any time that getter updates, I'll re-render those products. And the other thing that we build modules by default are something called FNS, or functions. And what they are, they're exactly that, functions. It's a group of pure functions dealing with this domain. A common case for something we put in functions is validation. Taking serialized form data and returning errors back is a pure operation. If you build that into your components, into your form components, testing that is extremely hard. It's not trivial to test form validation, especially with complex behavior or custom validation rules. And when you do, you end up kind of grabbing more than you want to test. You have to grab the DOM. You have to grab the runtime for that. You may have to set state up in your Flux implementation. But if you can take these types of things that can be bundled and compacted into pure functions, then you can test them trivially and consume them in more places. So this is a pattern that we really advocate, whereas if you can bring it into a function, we have a place for you to do this, and you should. And this is what a module looks like when it's used in a React component. So the big things to notice here, one is the React mixin, which we also have uh, decorators and higher order components for this as well. Um, but what this does is it sets up a lifecycle hook that looks at the get data bindings function. And the get data bindings function returns a mapping of state to getter. So in this example, this dot state dot products will always be the underlying value that this getter represents. So no matter what other parts of your system change this list of products, A, this component doesn't care about it, and B, this component will always be updated to reflect that. Having sugar in mixins or higher order components that abstract the notion of imperatively observing any of your state makes the life of anyone building a component much, much easier. And then as an example, this is how we would consume the products. Lastly, when we're building modules, building them isn't that easy. We actually have more boilerplate than before. So the way we chose to address this problem was with a very simple grunt task that is an interactive CLI generator, much like a Yeoman generator. And when we call this, it will interactively ask us, what stores do you want to make? What's the name of your module? And it will consistently create the same structure with tests already built in, where all you have to do is fill in the it block. And stores that have the same naming convention, files that have the same naming convention, and the same structure throughout our code base. And that's it. I have uh, some time for Q&A if anyone has questions. Yes. Uh, a couple. Firstly, uh, so for your mix-in when you're doing it as a higher order component, mm -hmm. um, 
how, how did you handle that transition? Is it, do you still map it somehow in the constructor now, or what does that higher order component kind of look like to achieve the same thing for mapping, uh, you know, observables to state changes? So we have a few different variants. Um, in one, I believe we still use the um, get data bindings. In another, we have a, a decorator approach. Um, at the end of the day, you just need some place where the get data bindings exist so that we can create this observation. So you, you would just like call it in the constructor or, or the higher order component would yes. have that as part of its own constructor? Yes. Okay. And uh, secondly, so you, you group the test in your modules, uh, do you still test components and it would just kind of dig out and find the components it needs and then require them that way? Um, or, because I mean, mm -hmm. you know, for stores and actions, I see why you would want it right next to it. Uh, it's right there, but when you're, you're testing components, how do you decide where component tests go? So component tests do not live with the module tests. Um, and in general, we've actually kind of gotten away from unit testing components. Yeah. Um, I personally don't think it's a great pattern. Um, a lot of times you're just saying, you know, does this equal this string? And you're really testing the framework in a lot of cases. Uh, what we found to be really useful is this idea of a, a full end-to-end -end unit test. Or, I'm sorry, UI integration test, where we build the real UI, we build the real state, and then we interact with it in the same way a user would, where we find elements and click on them, we assert text is on the page, we assert certain messages are shown, a certain number of items are shown, or you make the right save call. Um, because we found that these types of component tests don't really test the components communicating with each other, and that tends to be a pretty high point of failure, at least for us. So you, you test mostly stores then? Is that your, your big? So we actually test in a way that isn't purely unit testing. Okay. Um, because I don't like mocking a lot of things. Um, so for us, we'll have a module. And I'll, I'll go back a few slides for visualization. So we have a module, right? And the module declares a store. And then actions and getters are kind of the two sides to that store. An action is what you can do to change the state of the store, and a getter is something that reads the state. So a lot of our tests kind of test all three at once, where we dispatch an action that we expect the store to update in a certain way, and then we evaluate a getter to actually assert the state of that store. Yes? In this, in this module, presumably you're talking to some database back in HTTP, whatever. Where, just totally curious, how do you have to fetch modules slash functions, FNS, or? So we handle that in actions. Um, I can actually just open some code. That might be the easiest way to, to demonstrate this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's all of our modules. We'll look at one of the newer ones. We have like a view. bad one. Um, the, the overview, though, is, and I'll find an example. Here's a good one. So actions are not synchronous. What is synchronous is the dispatch. So a very common pattern in Flux is you have action started, action completed, action failed, action success. Um, so we, we use that pattern. Um, so here's an example. We have a function that fetches uh, for a project in Optimizely the results. 
So it takes in a configuration object that has the time range, the, the project ID, and we create a, a URL. And then when it's done, we dispatch that it's loaded. Um, we don't do things optimistically, but if you wanted to, it's, um, it's really just rearranging when you dispatch things. Yes? I noticed you're returning a promise chain. Do you ever continue that promise chain outside of this action creator file? Yes. Is, does that cause complexity and confusion anywhere, or is that pretty safe? In general, no, because the, the real danger here is you return a promise chain. That promise chain now has the server response in that, and you don't want that to be used in a specific component because we want to keep that response centralized in a flux store somewhere. Um, but the, the notion of getters makes it actually easier to do a fire and forget action and then have the component subscribe to that getter than it would be for a component to invoke this action, get the data out, put the data on some part of the component, like re-render. Um, so we use promises for just knowing when things are done. If there was a clean way to get rid of the uh, response and promises, we would. Because what we really want is just the timing of it. Um, because you shouldn't have something in a promise chain in your action that says, hey, this loading indicator on this component like should stop loading now. Um, so when we make calls from components that invoke actions that do something asynchronously, we'll say, you know, action, um, you know, make request, and that will return us a deferred. And then we have a function in my core that is, and that takes a key and a deferred. So anytime that, that deferred is in progress, that key is considered loading on, and when it's resolved or rejected, loading is off. Other questions? Yes? Um, does your framework handle the mobile um, No, in general, we build modules in a way that doesn't really make any opinion about the environment they're used in. Um, I'd say if we were to really want to create different experiences for mobile and for desktop, uh, we would fork our component layer, meaning we'd have a set of components that are for mobile and a set of components that are for desktop. And if you can put most of your logic in modules in a UI agnostic place, then forking these components is actually feels pretty clean because you're not duplicating any business logic. You're saying this implementation gets these set of components, this implementation gets these other set of components, and they use the same underlying logic. Yes? Uh, I have a question. So you have this core UI. Mm-hmm. And then you have these like, components that you look for to sort of like use these controllers, right? Um, what happens to components uh, when you have components when, you know, maybe they're shared between like three things, but they're very specific to one controller, like uh, project selector widget, something like that. Would that just be in core UI? I'm still curious. Uh, no, so a lot of our UI specific modules that are, they contain a lot of UI logic. So they can be one to one coupled with a specific component. Um, we put them into modules. So like the dashboard module here, that may be completely coupled to the dashboard component. So would you have like components also? No, so we generally keep them separate, um, and we like to keep the dependency chain one way. So a component can require as many modules as it needs, but the module never makes an assumption about what components it can be used for, because if you're creating modules correctly, they should be reusable anywhere. So I guess like a thing in terms of folder structure, like I see this dashboard component green, that could be like a bundle. Mm -hmm. So we do kind of mirror folder structure in some cases where you have components and modules and within each subfolder they are mirrored. Um, it hasn't really been an issue for us. You just kind of have to know where things live. And in general, when you're tracing the code, 
I think it's more natural to go to the component first rather than to the module, so you get the dependency graph from the requires. Yes? So, do you have any kind of distinction between, like, a, a module class or versus, like, a Um, so we don't instantiate any modules ever. Um, if we go back to, they just get completely as pure functions. Not as pure functions because they they're dependent on the environment state in Flux. So they're not pure functions, but they are functional. Um, so the notion of creating separate instances of specific functionality in our code base is handled within Flux. So imagine you have several components on the page and each one has its own kind of like state. Uh, what we'll do is we'll create a store that has the state of each of those, but ID'd. And then when the component's created, it'll dispatch an action that says, hey, register me in this store, and then it subscribes to that registration ID. I tend to think that the only reason why you'd want to instantiate something is for putting state in it. And if, if you have a, a flux system in place where you can do that, then I think it's easier to keep it as singletons. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>